And as you're seated, I'm going to ask if you would to take out your Bible and turn with me to the, the book of Philippians. If you do not have a sermon outline, just slip your hand up real quick, and these kind folks will gi- give you one right now. The, we study the Bible in a very in-depth way in the life of our church, so there's notes that are available to you. If you are clicking online and uh, watching this service online at a later time, you also can go to our Sheridan Hills Baptist Church website and download all of the notes, both either with the answers or without the answers that are there in order to help you pay attention. Some people say, well, so why do you do the notes? Well, we do the notes in part because your pastor is ADHD. Um, I am easily distracted and I'm a little bit hyperactive most of the time. And if I have something in front of me, I know it helps me. And I know that some of you are the same way. That's one reason. The second reason is if you take these notes home and you go over them even one time after the service, I know that God will use this lesson that much more. If you'll pray through this much, we've had several people that have said to me, Pastor, when you include the other uh, uh, passages of Scripture very often, I will go through and I will look all of them up and study them again during the week, and it just causes me to understand the message that much more. God's Word is worth our digging. In fact, our men are doing a a boot camp right now, and guys, you can still sign up for that on Thursday mornings. It's called Dig Deep. And uh, it's a book that is really um, inductive Bible study methods and tools. And uh, this last Thursday morning and Thursday night was a blast with our men. Uh, Had over 50 guys involved with it. I want to encourage you guys to uh, not miss out on that. So we come again to the study of Philippians um, with this beautiful book, uh, very often called the, the Letter of Joy in the New Testament, but it's written from a prison cell. It's written from a prison. And uh, Paul was under house arrest, um, and in that house arrest, um, chained to a guard, um, he wrote this letter to the Philippian people. Um, Leo Tolstoy said, he was one of the great intellectual writers of the Soviet Union or, or of Russia, um, said, you know, it's, it's really false thinking when each new generation thinks it's never been this bad before. Um, he said, you know, each generation thinks, oh my goodness, um, you know, these problems that we're experiencing today are new problems, or they've never been quite this bad. And um, he said, each generation needs to be careful to remember that many of the same issues, the same problems, and this is a man... Um, not speaking as a Christian. Uh, This is a man just as a a philosopher and writer, um, was recognizing that many of the problems from one generation to the next are largely the same. Same issues of the heart, same issues of the society, same issues in deficiencies and struggles that are there. Well, I apply what he says just a little bit to the life of the church. We often think, have you ever heard someone say, well, I just wish the church today was like the church of the New Testament. I just wish the church today was as faithful and as together and as joyful as the church of the New Testament. Let me just tell you, please don't necessarily wish that. Because there were a lot of problems in the church of the New Testament. I mean, if you were to just go through Corinthians, if you were to just go through certain aspects of of Thessalonians, if you were to look at the warnings that were given to Titus and to Timothy, it reveals that the early church dealt with all kinds of problems. They dealt with false doctrines. They dealt with unity problems. They dealt with rivalries. They dealt with great sexual immor- immor- immorality. There were things that had to be called out. There were names named um, that here 2,000 years later, we know people who were struggling with each other. We know that there were all kinds of issues and falsehoods in the church. And so the church has never been perfect. The church has never been um, in, a, in a situation where we would say, this is truly a church that represents Christ perfectly. There's never been a church that's like that. Now, the amazing thing is, is that while the church for 2,000 years has been imperfect in its practice and in its life in this world, 
we have a Savior who is perfect. And He is the one who rescues the church in all of her trouble and causes us, even when we are together, to be far greater together than we could ever be alone. And, um, and so it's in that vein that we look this morning at a problem that was in the Philippian church. There was, there was a problem not only in the Philippian church, but in the churches spread across the Mediterranean world during Paul's ministry. Here is, is part, just, just one section, one slice out of about a 30-year ministry of the Apostle Paul, and we get some insights of something that was going on back at the church at Philippi and also in the church in Rome that is there. So, for those of you who are new to us, I know there's people here for the first time this morning. Um, this little review can help you understand a little bit before we read the passage and before we dive into what we have this morning. Um, first of all, under the review, number one, Paul writes from a prison in Rome to the Philippian church and fill it in that he planted and that he loves. So, we've already seen he goes to Philippi. We see that in the book of Acts. Um, people start coming to Christ as he is witnessing there in the city, and he deeply loves this church. In fact, some of the most warm and um, affectionate words in the whole Bible are found in Philippians chapter 1 that we've already studied over the last few weeks. Number two, Paul awaits execution. So his circumstances aren't good. He's on death row. Paul awaits execution, and the Philippians endure much trouble. So they have trouble in their local town. They have trouble in their society. They have trouble as Christians um, in that place. And so both the writer and the recipients are under pressure. That's the point. And it's amazing because, number three, Paul wants them to know that he's truly okay. And that God is powerfully using, fill it in, his persecution for his, that is God's, grand plan and kingdom advancement. Now, this is amazing. All of this pressure, all of this trouble on them, and Paul, he is just overflowing with joy as he's writing to them saying, hey, look at what all God is doing. God is working. Here I am. We don't hear complaint in this. We actually hear contentment in this, as we will study and as we will see in the weeks ahead. But he's also doing this to a people who are under pressure. It's not like the Philippians are back at home and everything is honky-dory. No, they have their own struggle, and so Paul is writing to encourage them uh, in these things. Now, let's read the passage, and, and what we're going to do this morning, put a bracket up there, um, verses 12 through 14, just out there to the left or out there to the right, just put up there 12 through 14 last week. That was our sermon text from last week, but we don't want to separate it from the sermon text this week because, you know, the Bible, you really need to have context. If you don't have context, you can misunderstand what the Bible says. And so, verses 12 through 18 really go together, even though they're in two different sermons. So, let's read 12 through 14, and then we'll go on into our new text for this morning, which is 15 through 18. Look what it says in verse 12. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. And so, you remember last week we looked at what has happened to me, all of these troubles, all of these false accusations, all of these things, being taken in chains to Rome from Jerusalem, from Caesarea. Look at verse 13. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard, that's the Roman guard, and to all the rest that my imprisonment, underline it, is for Christ. So they know why this rebel rouser is in custody, and it's because of Jesus. He's saying they know the reason, and he's excited about this. He's saying this has actually served to advance the gospel. Look at verse 14. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now, do you hear complaint in this? You don't hear any complaint in this. What he's talking about is the good things that's coming out of the quote-unquote bad things that have happened to him. We go on into our text this morning. Look at verse 15. 
Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. Verse 16, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Verse 17, the former proclaim Christ out of, underline it, selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Verse 18, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. And so notice the sermon title up at the top. Would you read the sermon title this morning um, out loud with me? Let's read it out loud. What does it say? Reason to rejoice, Christ is proclaimed. That's what we see this text saying. And even when there's pressure, even when there's Roman pressure, he is rejoicing. Let's look at the things he's rejoicing. Though in, in prison, and fill these in, though in prison, um, Paul rejoiced in three things. We see two of them um, from last week. Number one, he had the opportunity to preach the gospel to his captors. Um, and we see that in verses 12 through 13. We just read it. He's up there, the whole imperial guard. We read in other places. He's actually chained to these guys 24 hours a day. Now, we could ask the question, who had who captive, right? I mean, the Romans thought that they had Paul captive, but actually, I think if you were chained to Paul, you were thinking he had you captive. And, you know, he loved it when there was a guard change because he just gets to start over, right? And uh, we see the result of this, not only in this text, but in numerous other texts, that Jesus is being proclaimed on a wider and wider basis to where all of Caesar's household, all of the people that were under the emperor, knew about Paul and knew about the gospel, many of them coming to believe. This is, this is truly amazing. We looked at the persecution last week and how God was using it. So, so he, he's preaching the gospel to his captor. Number two, his preaching in prison emboldened other believers to boldly preach the gospel. Um, I remember many years ago hearing uh, Twyla Paris, who was a Christian singer um, that was kind of big back in the 80s, I think. Um, but she told a story of during the Olympics, uh, during one of the Olympics, during uh, the 1980s, that there was a Christian believer from China. Uh, and this was back when there was a lot of persecution and a lot of trouble for Christians in China. And he stood there, having been a medalist, he had won something, and when given the opportunity, he said, I thank the Lord Jesus Christ for saving me. He said this immediately on open television while there representing China. He was, he was boldly proclaiming the gospel. And I remember hearing Twyla Paris said that she and her husband jumped off the, off the couch and started running around the living room going, he did it, he did it, he did it. And she thought how much that encouraged her and her husband and Christians around the world to boldly speak of the most important thing that could ever be upon the human heart, that when we see others boldly, lovingly proclaim the gospel, that we ourselves are encouraged in doing that. And that's what Paul is rejoicing in. Paul is rejoicing that Paul, excuse me, that others are encouraged by his boldness in the gospel. And then we come to the sermon today. Number three has to do with the one today. The gospel is being preached, fill it in, all the more even by those against him. And so we're going to look at that um, by those against him. Um, but Paul is rejoicing. He gets to preach to his captors. Other people hear about that, and they are encouraged to be bold, and they themselves speak to other people about the gospel. And number three, the gospel is being preached more and more all around, even by those who are against him. Now, this begs the question, who was against the apostle Paul? Who was against the Apostle Paul? Well, over the course of his ministry and his life, it was very much like um, you can ask the question, who was against the Lord Jesus Christ? If we were to have a discussion about that, we would say, so who was against Christ? Well, there were a few different groups that were against Christ. Number one, 
um, we would say one of the key groups that was against Jesus was the religious establishment of the Jews, right? They were against Christ. They, they didn't like the challenges that he was making to their leadership and to their way of, of doing, quote-unquote, religion. But also we recognize that Jesus uh, was tried by Roman um, authorities, and there were Roman authorities that didn't want a scene. They didn't want a, a disturbance of the peace. And so it was under Roman authority that Christ, in fact, would even be crucified. But we also saw that there were family members of Jesus. His own brothers and sisters showed up one time. His own brothers showed up to take him away, thinking that he had lost his mind. I mean, we, we, we see that even the inner core of his circle. And then, and then we see his own, his own key person, Peter, on the night before he's going to the cross, Jesus, his own key disciple, uh, Peter, James, and John, part of the inner core, Peter curses and says, I don't even know him, and denies him. And so we, we see that same type resistance on the Apostle Paul. Notice here with me, number one, there's non-converted Jews or the Jewish establishment that really hate Paul. In fact, those are the people who put him in chains and sent him off to Caesarea. Those are the people who were calling for his death. Um, he, at one time, was one of them. And there is nothing to get under the skin of someone other than having been like them to change out of that group and to represent another group that brings that iron. So there were the non-converted Jews. And then number two, there was the supposedly converted Jews who still pushed the Jewish law. So they claimed to be Christians, but they were still pushing the law. And in case if you haven't ever heard this word before, they were, they were called the Judaizers. And that simply means that they were trying to make um, any Christian still observe the law if they were Jewish, and even if they weren't Jewish, if they were Gentiles, they were being told, you have to come and submit yourself to the law. This was a corruption of the gospel. This was not the true gospel, but they would follow Paul around, and when he would leave a town, they would often show up and say, yeah, Paul told you about Christ. We agree with that, but you really need to keep the law too. He didn't tell you about that. So they would come disturbing what he had taught them about faith in Christ alone and not in the law, not in themselves. This was a big deal. The, it, Martin Luther would be declaring the same thing during the Protestant Reformation. Your salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You see, that is constantly under attack, was under attack in the first century, it was under attack in the 16th century, and it's even under attack today. So, similar problems. Well, a third group that was against Paul was the pagan Roman authorities. These are people who would not be called themselves Christians at all. In fact, they were involved in the pagan religion of Rome uh, or irreligious altogether, and they would be against Paul. They would be um, taking him in chains to Rome, and eventually they would cut his head off as a Roman citizen, and so they are certainly against him. But the fourth group is the one that concerns us this morning, and this is perhaps the one that does the greatest amount of injury to Paul. This is the jealous, rivalrous, home team Christians with wrong motives. So these were the ones who would be simply saying, oh, we, we are with you, Paul, in your message, but we know better than you. We're perhaps better preachers than you. Perhaps we are more, you know, we're more faithful because you have all this trouble. Look at us. We're not in jail. You're in jail. And so if you had more faith, then you would not be enduring these things. And that's a bit of a problem as we look and we see jealous, rivalrous, home team Christians with wrong motives. We get a little hint of this from 1 Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians. This is where our minds should go right away. Look what it says. I appeal to you. So he's writing to a different church. He's writing to them. But we see the same kind of problems that are coming up. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree. 
So put above that disunity. They had a unity problem. The church was not in agreement with each other. So that all of you agree and that there be, there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Verse 11, for it has been reported to me, so there's somebody going back to Paul and saying, you're not going to believe what's going on in Corinth. And that's why he writes the letter. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. Verse 12, what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. I'm better than all of you. I follow Christ. Verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, speaking of himself? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Christus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. Now, don't flip the sheep. Just notice here that he is saying to them, look, don't be divided. And, and it appears that some have come in preaching saying that, you know, this teacher is better than this teacher, and this group over here thinks that they're better than everybody else because they're following Jesus and not Paul and everything. And Paul is saying, no, we've been confessing Christ. He's not condemning the message of Apollos. He's not condemning the message of Peter. But he is simply saying, you all are divided, following in with your various teachers that you prefer, and you're dividing yourselves in the body of Christ when, in fact, he keeps calling them brothers. Many of these here, he is saying to you, you are indeed brothers in Christ. Why are you being so divided? So we see that this is a problem in the early church. We see that this is, in fact, he says, he can't even remember who all he's baptized in the following verses of that. He says, I don't remember if I baptized anybody else. I mean, Paul was traveling around. He was doing a great work decade after decade. He wasn't sure exactly who all he had baptized in various places. He had probably baptized thousands and thousands of people who had come to faith in Jesus. But what his point was, look, the point is not my greatness or anyone else's greatness. The point is the greatness of Christ. And so he is, he is clearly saying, do not say that you're of Paul. I don't want you wringing that around my neck. I don't want you having that attitude, and even if it appears and even if it applies to me. Flip your sheet and let's look and see. So what is Paul teaching us in this? And there's some real lessons for the modern church. There are some real lessons for Sheridan Hills Baptist Church in 2019 and any other church that is alive and well on the, on the planet today. Let's read verse 15, 16, 17, and 18 again, just so it's fresh on our minds, and then we can see some things that Paul is teaching us. Look at verse 15. So indeed, preach Christ. Excuse me. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former, so those who preach from rivalry and envy, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So that's how rough it's gotten that the home team is even seeking to annoy Paul when he can't do, deal with it outside of prison. He know, they know that word is going to get back, that they are, that they are probably trash-talking Paul, and they are, they are saying, look at all of his trouble, look at all of his problems. Obviously, he's not doing something right. And so here they are seeking to annoy him while he's in prison, even with the body of Christ. Look at verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. What is Paul trying to teach us? Number one, God's work among people, and that's the Christian ministry of the church. So God's work among the people, in God's work among the people, there are either right motives or wrong motives. And this applies throughout the centuries. This applies throughout churches. And this applies throughout various missionaries and various ministries around the world. 
Some are going to do it with right motives, and some are going to do it with wrong motives. And the words that are used in this, up there in the box on the top of the page, underline the word envy and rivalry, because that's the first one that we see. Envy. The idea of envy is, why do they have that? Why do they have that? This is when someone looks at somebody else and says, why does he have that? I wish he didn't have that. It's, It's... it's a little different than jealousy. Jealousy is, I want what you have. I wish I had that. Envy is even a little bit more diabolical in that I don't want you to have that. And so maybe these guys are looking at the Apostle Paul and seeing his influence. They know who he is and what has happened and they, are, are quite, they see that a lot of people have followed him. And so these guys are preaching Christ, wishing that not only did they have what he had, but seeking to diminish him and to elevate themselves. Um, and so this is the idea of why do they have that. Rivalry is who's better than who? Am I a better preacher than Paul? Well, if I'm a better preacher than Paul, um, more people will follow me. And my friends, both in Christendom, in the missionary world, or in a church family, these things can rear their ugly head. This kind of division can come and start to inject itself into the life of the church. And some of you have been in churches where this has been rampant. Some of you have been in churches where the church is very divided, they're seeking to follow after various groups. And in this present day and time, there's, um, there's a lot of different things available on the internet. Um, there's all kinds of teaching groups that are available on the internet from various different perspectives. The internet has made all of it available all of the time in great number. And so you can very narrowly go in on a certain Um, aspect of your doctrine and of your theology and ministry philosophy, and you can become very narrow in that. Now, I do believe that we need to be very narrow in the reality that Christ alone is what saves us. The only way in which we can be saved is through the shed blood of Christ on the cross, gone to the grave, risen from the dead, overcoming our sin and death. That is the narrow way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He was not ambiguous about that. He was very, the the Bible tells us, as Jesus would also say, wide is the road that leads to destruction. And many are those who go by the road of destruction. But narrow is the gate that leads to life. And few are those who find it. And so, the narrowness of the gospel is is truly God's glorious plan. There's no question that God has made that very, very clear. Well, this this rivalry and this this envy comes about of them being contentious and and really being, they're, they're both within the name of the gospel, but they are really being selfish in this. So, the envy and the rivalry is juxtaposed against the goodwill. And so look up at page 50, I mean, uh, verse 15 again. It says, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others circle those two words from what? Goodwill. So now goodwill here does not mean charity. Very often here in American society, we, we hear the word goodwill and we think, oh, well, that's, that's like, um, you know, we're going to give this stuff to goodwill. It's charity. Um, don't associate goodwill always with just charity because we have a large organization that does good helps and good, good works of, of help for the poor um, named goodwill. What we need to recognize is this isn't just necessarily charity, but this is the right motive. That's what this is about. This is, this is about doing it for the right reason. And we see, notice this, the difference between both of these. Envy envy and rivalry, ultimately the source of that is selfishness. And we see that in verse 17. Look what it says in verse 17. The former proclaimed Christ out of, underline it, selfish ambition. Not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. So they're, they're proclaiming Christ ultimately 
for selfish reasons. You say, really? You mean they would get the gospel right and yet do it for the wrong reasons? Happens every day. You know what? It's happening right now around the world this morning. The problem hasn't gone away. There are some who, preaching the, who are preaching the gospel for the wrong reasons, and we'll look at that in more detail. But Lotus here as well, the others are preaching it out of the right reasons. Look at verse 16. It says, the latter do it out of love. They preach the gospel out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. They say, he's saying, they understand that the reason I'm in a Roman prison and chained guards and the gospel is going all throughout Caesar's household, they understand that I'm here for God's reason. God has a bigger plan. Maybe God is preserving a level of freedom for the proclamation of the gospel in Rome and even the whole Roman Empire while he's sitting in prison as Caesar listens perhaps to the gospel or other influential people are saying, well, wait a minute, we shouldn't wipe him out yet. We got a guy in prison down here and he's, we're finding out more about what they believe. We're trying to figure out who they are and everything else. And God is saying, excuse me, the apostle Paul is saying, God has me here for the defense of the gospel. And so those who are preaching Christ in Rome and those who are maybe preaching Christ in Philippi, and there's some of them that are doing it for the right reasons and they understand why I'm here. Now, all of this fits together like lock and key. It's beautiful. You see the source of that love. Some of them, they're preaching the gospel and they're accepting Paul's state uh, out of love for him because they love him personally. We, we know that there was a, a true love relationship between both Christians in Rome and Christians in Philippi. Some Christians in Rome, some Christians in Philippi. We would also say that it would be applicable to say this love that they had was for Christ. And so they're genuine Christ followers following following Christ in love. And that's why they love the gospel being preached. And it would also be for people. Um, they love the fact that the gospel is being proclaimed to people. Um, in fact, I believe that true Christians are going to love the gospel going out in the world to a lost and dying world. They, they love these truths. So look at number one up there at the top. In God's work among people, the Christian ministry of the church, there are either right motives or there are wrong motives. Number two, this passage in verse 18 shows us that you can have the right message but with the wrong motives. You can have the right message but with the wrong motives. Look at verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Now here's the deal. These guys were not Judaizers. The people who were against Paul preaching the gospel, they were not teaching from this text, it is indicating they were not teaching a false gospel. They had their doctrine correct, which is rather puzzling, and it's rather, it reveals to us the depth of the problem. It reveals to us it's not just their gospel is off, their message is off. No, they've got the right gospel, they've got the wrong motives, and that's very concerning. Look at this. They were not Judaizers. These were preachers of orthodox gospel truth. What is, you mean Greek orthodox? No, no, no. Long before Greek orthodox. Orthodox means straight thinkers or people of straight opinion. Um, popular, I mean, excuse me, proper opinion, proper understanding. So when we say that something is orthodox, we say, okay, that is the traditional proper understanding of it. Orthodox Christianity is a good thing. It means that Christ alone is the salvation of the world. Orthodox Christianity would say the church is his people. Orthodox Christianity would say, you know, basic membership in the life of the church is important. This is orthodox doctrine and truth. So these were preachers of orthodox truth. But they were, they were people who were preaching the gospel with what I call the poisonous peas or the poisonous peas of gospel ministry. I'm not talking about poisonous green peas, but poisonous problems that are here. I thought all peas were poisonous when I was a kid. Some of you did too. Um, that's not the peas I'm talking about, Mom. Um, this is talking about um, problems of motive, problems of heart. And, and I want you to fill these out because these are really important. And these have no place in the preaching of the gospel. The first one is pride. Pride 
destroys the real power of the gospel when it's in the, with, when it's in the individual man. His, his motives are corrupt in that. Pride. How about power? When someone is preaching the gospel for power, they want influence. Similar to that is position. They love the position. They, they love the position as evangelists. Well, they love the position of being in front of people. They love the position of people listening to them and in, being influential with them. How about prestige? Similarly rela- related is this idea of status or prestige that they would come, that they would say that this elevates them above others, which in itself is a very ungodly and unchristlike attitude. The last P that I would have there is profit. There are people that with the gospel and through the gospel, they seek to, to make a, a fortune. They seek to make a wealth that is for themselves. This, is, this isn't talking about typical pay for their, for their lives, but this is talking about they're seeking to get rich off the gospel. And we see that. Do we not see all of these even in this present day and time? Do we not look through Christian history and look through the history of the church and see that at various stops along the way, this was a great problem all the way back? In fact, we can go all the way back to the first century, and we see that there were various people preaching the gospel just for the money. Notice this with me. These seek human recognition, not humble recognition reflection of Christ. And that is a key difference. They're wanting human recognition or the things that these things can give instead of humble reflection. And what I mean by that is not meditation. What I mean by that, and I, and I meant to bring a mirror here this morning and hold up a mirror to you and to, and to just recognize that we are called to be a reflection of Christ to the world. And so if I were to have a mirror here and shine it through this room, the bright lights that are shining right here, they would be reflected back into your eyes. And that is the picture of who a preacher of the gospel should be. He should be showing Christ, not himself. And so that's what we see. The, the false teachers that are around the Apostle Paul, they have the right message, but they have the wrong motive, and they're seeking to do that. Now, this is possible these right message, wrong motive is possible in several areas of Christian ministry. It's not just the pulpit. The first one is, I'm going to say preaching. This is the first place that you may see it. But let's just go ahead and name some names here. It could also be in singing. And that's been, you know, real popular in the last 100, 150 years here in America and Western culture. Um, Singing, um, you know, the very popular Uh, ideas of, you know, who's a great vocalist or who's a great instrumentalist. And and it can be about music and about the population of music being, being very powerful in this and right message, but wrong motives. How about the third one here? Teaching. So it may not be the preacher in front of the church, but it could be teachers in the church. And we see this perhaps with Apollos, and we see this perhaps with Peter and with others who would come through. Um, you can see this in present churches, even in this day and time, that there are some people that through what they're seeking to teach in the life of the church, there's rivalries, and one guy is teaching this, and the other guy is saying, no, you're wrong, and it's perhaps on nuances um, of the gospel, but there's a rivalry over teaching. Who is the better teacher? Who has the bigger class? How about the next one, leading? People who want to lead in the life of the church. And, you know, oh, I'm a leader. You know, I, it's the idea of, of the esteem that goes with being a leader with some responsibility. Even serving. Some people that would serve for the wrong reasons. They would do the right things, but for the wrong reasons. Wanting the recognition of others around them in the church. What about giving? I mean, Jesus really dealt with that one when he said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. You're not to be giving to be a show before men. It's not to be that, you know, in, in some churches, um, the couple who gives a lot or the individual who gives a lot, well, they have more say in how things go or in what happens. That is, that is patently diabolical and false. That should not be the case. We are to all give sacrificially. 
And so the, the little widow woman who has a very small income who gives sacrificially, Jesus said, has given more than everybody else. And so this is, this is a, a, a real issue of, of wrong motives and wrong perspectives that are here. And what about going? I put going on here and this put out there to the side, missionaries. Um, there are some people who think, oh, well, this guy's gone to the really hard place. He, he's really in the difficult place. And, you know, in the midst of the missionary community, I'm glad that we didn't see it a lot, but every now and then it would kind of come up. There'd be somebody who, you know, because they lived in this country and they lived in this circumstance, you know, supposedly they were more holy and more committed than anybody else. Now, I, I do think that missionaries who make some very big um, difficult choices to do that, that the vast majority of them do that because God has called them to go there and be there and to do that. And you won't last very long in the really hard places of the world if you're there for the wrong reasons. I mean, it just, it doesn't really last very long. But some people, um, you know, they, they are rather braggadocious about where all they've been and what all they've done for the sake of the gospel. All of these things are the poisonous peas of ministry and the the poisonous outplay of them. I do think it is a problem um, when people are getting rich off the gospel, whether in music or in preaching or in writing. Um, I, I don't think that the gospel is to be profited from and to make one wealthy and rich. And I, I have a problem with that with many singers. Um, and, you know, it's, you, you need to be very careful of that um, in the course of things. I, I, I would just warn that you're going to stand before the one who died for everyone, and you're going to give an account um, for what you did with your life. There's nothing wrong with wealth. There's nothing wrong with being rich in itself. But to profit off the, pre- off the preaching of the gospel or in the sake of the gospel is going into an area that needs to be very, very carefully navigated because that can get you in trouble, I believe, very quickly. Number two, you have the right message but the wrong motives. Number three, the right message, fill it in, can trump the wrong motives. The right message can trump the wrong motives. Now, here is this glorious thing. These guys are preaching the right message with the wrong motives, but the message wins. And this is a glorious thing that we see in verse 18. Well, look what he says in verse 18. In fact, let's read verse 18 out loud together. Everybody read it. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Here's the point. The right message is trumping their wrong motives. It's overcoming them. Remember the hard-hearted, angry, bigoted prophet named who? Jonah. Jonah was told to go down and preach at Nineveh. And he, he didn't even say no. He just went and immediately, if you look at verse 2 of Jonah chapter 1, the Lord says, Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach the gospel. <laughs> verse 2. Jonah got on a boat headed to Tarshish. That's the opposite direction. He didn't even give God the courtesy of saying, I don't think that's a good idea, or I don't want to do that, or whatever. He just ran for the port, got on the boat, headed the wrong direction. We know how that played out. And then we come back, and we see in chapter 3, after he gets spit out on dry land, Jonah, go to Nineveh and preach the gospel. So this time, he goes. He didn't run for the sea again. He goes, and he stands there, and he preaches the gospel in the city of his arch enemies. And as he is preaching the gospel to his enemies, he sees them repent and cry out to God for mercy. Now, we see in Jonah chapter 4, and in Jonah chapter, we, we see him angry. It says he was angry. He was angry that God was gracious to them. He he was preaching to them the whole time, hoping none of them would repent. He wanted God to get them. He wanted the judgment to come. 
But God gets a hold of the, the leader of the people of Nineveh. God gets a hold of the leadership in general, and then all the way down to the people, and they repent. They put dust on their animals. They don't give their animals food or water. They themselves do not drink or eat in a holy fast, saying, God, have mercy upon us. And God indeed has mercy. And Noah or Jonah is just angry about that. Now, the amazing thing is he had the wrong motives in his preaching. He was reluctant to it, but God still moved and saved the city. Isn't that cool? Um, the, the message of God um, is it, it, it overcomes even our wrong hearts. Look at Isaiah 55, verses 10 through 11. I'm going to read verse 10, and then you're going to read with me verse 11, so be ready. Here we go in verse 10. Look what it says. For just as rain and snow fall from heaven and do not return without watering the earth, making it bud and sprout and providing seed to sow and food to eat, verse 11, read with me, so my word that proceeds from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please, and it will prosper where I send it, whether by Jonah or by you, that God will use this word that goes out. Number four, ultimately, the power is in the message, not the messenger. This is so gloriously true for the sake of Christian ministry, that the power is in the message. This is why we need to get the message right. And it is good, and it is right that we do it with the right motive. But the power is in the message, not the messenger. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul writes, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, underline it, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. You see, it's not Paul's persuasiveness. He's called to be persuasive, and he's called to preach the gospel for the right reasons, but those are not the things that save people. It's the truth that God has come to save people from their sin. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse or 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8. It says, "So do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God." You see, we are called and we're invited to join in to even the hardship and the suffering of the gospel because God uses that for his purposes. If all that you do in your preaching and in your sharing, in your ministry, is always met with accolades and ease and commendation, friends, the message may not be the, the right message with the right motives. We need to recognize that there's going to be resistance and there's going to be resistance to this church. There's going to be resistance to you as you speak the gospel to friends that are around you. Now, it's not you, what you don't want to do is make you the reason for the resistance. Let it be the gospel that's that. You don't need to be odd for God and be pushy and harsh. You don't need to be apologetic for the sake of the gospel. Simply allow God to speak through you the gospel of Christ and his message his truth, his word will not return void. So how do we apply all of this? Um, Paul's, Paul's teaching us some things here that are very important. These verses, 15 through 18, are given to us for some very important reasons through the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's two things that I think that you can be greatly encouraged by. Number one, you can proclaim Christ in your persecution and suffering. You can proclaim Christ in your persecution and suffering. That's what Paul was doing. And that's what the Philippians were doing. That it was in the midst of that that God, some people would say, well, in all of my hardship, no one wants to listen to me because of my hardship, because of my cancer, because of my, my brokenness, or because of my failures even in the past. Listen, God says, you be faithful to speak the gospel, and I will be faithful to bless the word that is spoken. And so, in your persecution and in your suffering, you can share the gospel. Look at the next part. You can proclaim Christ in your weakness and frailty. That's what this means. It's not the powerful, persuasive wordsmith that is only used by God. 
It is the person who faithfully speaks the gospel of truth, who faithfully lives the gospel of truth to the people that are around them that brings them. And, and it may be in your weakness. It may be in your frailty. Look at Johnny Erickson Tata. Johnny Erickson Tata in a wheelchair for over 50 years. Johnny Erickson Tata, who in pain and in difficulty has never been able to be all that a fully healthy person be. You say, who is she? She was a tetraplegic, which means that from the neck down, she was completely disabled. When you look at Johnny's life, you see that it was in weakness and frailty that God's message became powerful. The Apostle Paul himself would say, for when I am weak, then I am strong. I would rather boast about my weaknesses, recognizing that this exalts the glory and the majesty of Christ. So church family, here's the deal. We need to be aware of wrong motives in ministry. And we need to seek to do everything that we do, any place in the life of this church, for the right reasons. And that means exalting Christ. Christ being the center. Christ being the one who receives the glory and the attention. By His grace, He can give us that strength. He can straighten out a heart that has the wrong motives. You bring a heart that has the wrong motives, He can fix that. I know that because he's doing that to me all the time. I often have the wrong motives, church. I have to commit my heart to the Lord over and over again. I have to submit my heart to the Lord over and over again every day on this very issue. And if I can do that, you can do that. We come before God saying, God, for the right moments, for the right motives, let me get their message right so that you are glorified. This is the heart of Christ. And, you know, whatever your strengths are, whatever your weaknesses are, allow God to use you. Come to Him in submission and in glory, letting Him be the one who receives the glory for the sake of His kingdom and His goodness. Amen? Amen. Would you stand together as we pray?